Good evening, and thank you all for joining us. Um, this is a big welcome to um, the Abstermont Down branch of the Western Front Association in conjunction with the Public Record Office of Northern Ireland. Um, we jointly hold events every month, and it's great to continue to receive some interviews. Uh, today's talk is going to be by Dr. William Butler from the National Archives in London, and he'll be talking about Irish. He'll be talking about military records, TNA, and more importantly, how to use them. You'll have noticed we've, we've all you've, you've all been muted on entry. That's so that um, there's no background distractions. I should also say that we are recording tonight's talk, so um, anybody who who doesn't want really who doesn't want their image to appear, I suggest I'm turning your videos off. The talk will be about 45 to 50 minutes, and the, hopefully we'll have a good Q and A at the end. Um, We'll we'll try and um, ask some most questions, um, and depending on t on time, we'll uh, that could go about another fifteen twenty minutes. Um, okay, that's pretty much all I've got to say, and I'll pass you over to the chair of the Arthur and Down Western Front Association, Ian Montgomery. Thank you very much, Stephen, and welcome uh, all of you to this. Um, October meeting of uh, the Antrim and Down branch of the Western Front Association. Uh, it's the second of our autumn meetings. And uh, very pleased to see all, uh, all of you here today. It's, it's, it is a very good turnout. Um, so just I'll just welcome tonight's speaker. Uh, the, the format for these meetings, if you haven't been before, the speaker will we'll, get the speaker on a, a, in a couple of minutes. And then uh, at the end of the talk, if you have any questions or any points you want to raise during the course of the talk, if you'd use the chat facility uh, and, there, and write it in chat and we'll come to you at the end of um, Will's talk and pick up the questions there. Um, so Will Butler is no stranger to, uh, to the Western Front Association and particularly to this branch. Uh, or, or the to Prone. He's spoken to the branch on several occasions when we actually did meet in in the flesh, as were in a room in Prone, uh, in, the, in the far distant past. So it's a great pleasure to see him he, here again virtually. Um, he is the author of, of a number of books on uh, on the army, um, the Irish amateur military tradition, which was his PhD at the University of Kent, and he's also co-authored books on recruitment in Ireland during the First World War and the British Army in Ireland. Uh, he's now the principal military specialist at the, the National Archives in London, uh, and so very well qualified to speak on tonight's subject, which is uh, the records which are in TNA uh, relating to, to the Army. So with no more ado, I shall pass you over to Will. And as I say, we'll pick up the questions when after Will's finished his talk. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Ian. I'm just going to do the obligatory, bear with me a moment while I start sharing my screen. So let me just get that up. Hopefully you can all see me. Sort of, yeah, Ian, if you let me know, or someone just say, or Ian or Stephen, if you say yes, that you can hear that, I can see that, that'd be great. Um, good evening yep. every wonderful thank you uh good evening everybody thank you um well thank you ian for that um very um kind introduction it's um yeah a real pleasure to be here with you this evening although i would of course have preferred to have been with you in northern ireland as i, I never need an excuse um to to uh to come over um and and talk and and certainly use use peroni's collections uh as well and uh, as has already been said, I'm, I'm going to talk to you this evening about researching the British Armed Forces in the 19th um, and 20th century. And I've, I've kind of covered uh, in the talk the Army, the Navy and the Air Force. And I mean, it, it might become apparent that I'm certainly much more of an Army specialist, but, but absolutely, um, you know, uh, in particular, my job requires me to, to also... Uh, be somewhat of a specialist or, or at least have some insights on on naval and air force records as well and what i uh, and, and i hope it kind of comes across throughout the um the the talk this evening i didn't want to make this a, a kind of skills session which sometimes we do uh, with some of our talks that we do at the national archives and i didn't want to make it too much of a how-to step-by-step -step guide 
um, how to use the records. What I really wanted to do is highlight the kind of range and breadth, the breadth and range of, of the records that we hold uh, at the National Archives and hopefully provide you with some uh, interesting examples, some interesting individuals that I, I myself have been lucky enough to, to research and, and research using the records that we hold. Uh, at the National Archives and, and hopefully keep your interest in, in doing so. Like I say, I, I didn't want this to be <clears throat> as much as possible. I didn't want this to be a kind of dry run through of the records. And uh, but but hopefully you will find it useful from that kind of skills point of view uh, as well. And, and as certainly as Ian and Stephen mentioned, please do put questions in the chat as we go through. I'll be covering quite a lot, I, uh, quite, uh, as I say, a, a breadth uh, of material, a breadth of time periods as well. Um, so, you know, just in case any questions slip out of your mind, do please put them in the chat um, as as we go along. And I, I will also try my best to to answer them. And what I would say, you know, anything that you you know perhaps miss or that I'm not particularly clear, there's obviously the recording uh, of of this um, this evening, but also. Uh, one of the thing, one of the great resources that that we have at the National Archives, and, and I'm sure many of you have used them um, in the past, are research guides. We have a large number of research guides on our collections, particularly our military collections, and I'll provide a link for that at the end of the talk as well, if people want to kind of go away and have a look at that in a bit more detail. Two. So after all of that kind of setting up and uh, I'm kind of rambling on at the beginning. Let's start, and I'm gonna. I am gonna start um, with the army to to begin with. And what I've what I've kind of done is split certainly this army section in into two sections, uh, looking first of all, and us thinking about pre 1913, the surviving records for the pre 1913 period, and then or specifically uh, the second section will deal with the First World War because, and again, I'm sure that a lot of you are already aware. Our, our First World War collection is is enormous. Um, and then I'll also separately go through the Navy and then also the RAF after that. And then finally, I'm going to talk a little bit very briefly in passing, um, if we have time, uh, about the post First World War records that we hold. And I'll touch upon also the large service record transfer that's currently happening uh, from the Ministry of Defence to the National Archives, which some of you might be aware of. Um, and, and like I say, I'm happy to to talk a little bit about that uh, as well. So pre-1913, you know, realistically, um, service prior to the First World War is a, or can be a rather complicated puzzle in terms of finding out the information that you might want to, to find. Self-contained service records like those during the First World War don't exist in quite the same way. There are exceptions to that. Um, but they don't quite exist in, in quite the same format. And, and really what you have to do is piece together uh, a soldier service using a mixture of, of the surviving records. And in general, that would be things like using muster books and pay lists for, for regiments, uh, discharge papers, and also pension records as well. And as I say, those attestation records, the enlistment records are patchy at best. Uh, and, and also, as I say, only exist really in certain circumstances. And again, as for the researcher, that can be quite challenging. So I'll just kind of show you a pop up um, a few, and, I'm, and as I say, I'm not gonna do this in too much detail throughout, but here's a few kind of record series that you might find, muster rolls and pay lists and, and what information you might actually get from them. So, you know, they provide uh, quite limited information, again, uh, especially in comparison to a full service record. So, you certainly get a name, you get things like the pay that they receive, their conduct, some enlistment uh, books and pay, uh, sorry, muster rolls and pay lists have enlistment dates and movements and discharge date, dates and that kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, and, and really the key piece of information for this, and it's it's something that we, we get a lot of inquiries when people are especially searching for 19th century soldiers, is you realistically need to know the regiment in which a soldier served. If you're lucky enough for some of the records are digitized and I'll talk about some of those in a minute but for this kind of record most of these muster rolls and pay lists aren't digitized in the same way and the way that they're searched is by regiment and that, that's kind of your way in um, to to those records so uh, it's really crucial that that you know the regiment that someone might have served in. 
And, and like I say, I'm going to sort of show you a few examples as we go through here. So this is for uh, the Royal Artillery Records of Service muster books. So these are a little more detailed. They do provide um, quite, a, quite a bit of detail here. And this is for an individual who served during the Crimean War. And we get various information about his service, his conduct, also the, the kind of physical description side of things as well, um, which you do in a kind of a bigger uh, attestation paper. But then, and, and I appreciate that it might be quite small on the page here. Um, this is an example of a muster book and pay list on the left hand side. It's what it looks like on the catalogue to give you an idea of, again, what you might need to actually do in order to search um, for for this kind of record. And then on the right hand side, the information you can get. And really, as, as I say, it's, it's fairly limited. You've got a name here. You've got um, kind of uh, periods of time and then also the amount of pay that's being given as well. And that's really the only kind of information that you're going to get from this kind of uh, and this type of record. Now, th these two sets of records in, in WO25 and WO76, they're one of my favourite sets of records or two of my favourite sets of records. And I find that they are um, an incredibly underutilised set of records. And they're the entry books and registers. And a lot of these have actually been digitised. You can download them from uh, Discovery, the National Archives catalog. Um, again, they're catalogued by regiment and by year. So you'll need to know a regiment or a year that you want to look at. Um, and that normally is the kind of older designation. So um, re a regiment of foot, a number and regiment of foot that you'd have to know. Um, and they include both officers and other ranks. And a lot of the officer records are actually catalogued by name. So that's that's helpful. The other For the other ranks, that isn't the case, which is why you'll need to know the regiment. Um, but there are kind of problems with with the searching here. They're, they're not a full run of records so that we don't have every year and we don't have every single regiment that they haven't survived, unfortunately. Um, so there's a bit of luck involved there. Um, and it's not always obvious whether a volume includes officers or other ranks, either from the catalogue description. And essentially, as a research method, this can be quite time consuming, especially in comparison to searching for individual names, obviously on something like Ancestry or Find My Past, um, but it can yield some incredibly useful um, results. And you know, if you're willing to put the time in, you're looking for an individual. So an example here, you know, someone looking for information about someone called Charles Hall, who they think served in the Suffolk Regiment in the 1820s. You know, how do we actually go about finding it? Well, the 1820s, the Suffolk Regiment didn't exist in the same way. So we'd have to know the, the kind of the older regimental uh, designation, um, which in this case is the 12th foot. And we have a, a description of succession book for the period 1822 to 1830. And this is what they look like. Again, quite challenging to read in some ways. I'll slightly zoom in um here so that you can see some of the information and actually that bottom entry there you'll see is for a charles hall and and it gives you the kind of information or shows you here the kind of information that you can get from these books and in my view these this set of records these description and succession books are, are really underutilized even though they're digitized and you know that's always the big big thing they have been digitized the the quality is sometimes a bit hit and miss, and that's primarily because of the quality of the originals, actually, rather than the, the scan. But um, if you're willing to put the work in, they are incredibly interesting, incredibly eye opening from from that point of view uh, as well. So it's there are always a set of records that I'm keen to, to promote and to get people to think about if they are struggling to find a soldier, an individual um, who served in particular, especially the, the early half of the 19th century that these books are particularly good for as well. And then what about the end of a soldier service? So again, there's just a, a whole load of uh, references here. So soldiers discharged due to disability, uh, the Royal Hospital Chelsea admission books, discharge papers, uh, registers of effects, uh, and, and other kind of pension records. And you'll see that the vast majority of these and I'm sure that some of you might have used these in the past, uh, are available online through Ancestry or Find My Past um, and are searchable by name. So it's incredibly useful. The issue with, with a lot of these records, particularly the, um, you know, the pension records, the, um, the discharge records in general, is that an individual really will only 
um, appear in most of these sets of records if they received an army pension. So that would be either because of disability or because of the length of service um, that they carried out. So you won't necessarily find someone who only, um, you know, in the 1860s only served for five years, they wouldn't have been eligible for a pension by that point. So they're not found uh, in these registers. And that's one of the kind of drawbacks and the, and the problems with, with searching um, for individuals in that way. Uh, but hopefully you can kind of use the um, dis uh, description and succession books as a, an alternative for that. And this is, again, an example so uh, of what the register looks like for soldiers discharged due to disability. In this case, is um, kind of a slight closer look as to what that might look like. And there's some kind of basic personal information about in, an individual, what regiment they served in, where they served, um, where they lived what their character was, what was the cause of their discharges. It's obviously particularly interesting. And then here we have um, the Royal Hospital Chelsea admission books, um, and specifically there are uh, books for soldiers living at home, but then also soldiers living abroad um, as well. And here's an example of that. And these books look uh, roughly the same as, as those other ones. Now, obviously, there's a, there's a whole host of other records. And what I should say is that, you know, there's no way that this evening I could cover absolutely every set of record, uh, records that we hold on every aspect and for every period. I'm kind of, you know, the, 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 my idea today, hopefully, really, is to kind of highlight some of these key and, so, and in some cases underutilized records as well. Um, but I just wanted to highlight a few other records. We there are obviously army lists, and a, and a whole load of those army lists are available for free and digitised by the National Library of Scotland, which give you obviously information about officers. Um, the National Archives holds uh, an array of courts martial records for the First World War. A lot of those are digitised, but for other periods, not so much. So they're always worth um, having a look. And there are also, of course, the campaign medal rolls as well, most of which. Uh, certainly up to the First World War are, are digitised. And, you know, looking elsewhere, there are Sandhurst registers for officers, which have been digitised as well, which can be a useful option. And then the Indian Army is, is, is a kind of interesting one. It's a tricky one for us at the National Archives. We hold, we hold some records for uh, individuals who served in um, the Indian Army. And... Uh, but not a huge amount. The majority of those records are were India office records and so are held at the British Library. Um, but like I say, there are ex some exceptions to that as well. So um, it's always worth having a look um, at, at TNA for that. And again, there is a specific research guide for um, the British Indian Army as well. Um, so the, uh, kind of bits to, to, to be aware of really from, from that. Um, point of view. And uh, again, this is just a few examples. So this is a courts martial record from 1857, which is a district courts, mar courts martial register. Um, so all of the list of individuals down the left hand side, and then various bits of information, the regiment information, the nature of the charge, the sentence, uh, and any remarks. And that's the kind of most information you're going to get from these kind of registers, but they can be quite useful. Um, if you're looking for an individual or have come across an individual who had disciplinary issues. And the rather more kind of limited, these are, this is the campaign medal role for the Crimean War. And again, realistically, the most you can do with these is to uh, confirm that someone was eligible for that medal. If you're looking for an individual, there's not much um, more information there other than a potentially a regimental number and a rank. Uh, as well so um but you know worth having to and um, worth looking at to confirm uh, certain aspects as well so and i kind of said I'm, I, I wanted to talk about a few individuals rather than kind of sweeping through um you know all of the these kind of different areas so this is an individual that um i was lucky enough to to research quite recently i came across uh, Louis James Tibbles when I was uh, working on a project to do with the Royal Hospital Chelsea. We have most of the Royal Hospital Chelsea uh, kind of administrative records in relating to pensions because the hospital prior to the middle of the First World War was responsible um, as well as having in pensioners of course it was also responsible for uh, administering out pensions. 
uh, as as well so we have a, a whole host of of those kind of records and and louis was was someone i came across actually whilst looking at the we we also have minutes of meetings of the hospital board and he 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 was someone who came or i came across in in those meetings uh, or in those minutes uh, as someone who transferred from the war office uh, in the early part of the war to work as a clerk at the hospital um as it so happened, thankfully, from, from my point of view and from a research point of view, his service record was available um, through the Chelsea uh, Pensioners Army Service Record Series in W97. Uh, and that's primarily because he served for a period of 21 years, so he was entitled to a pension. So therefore, we had a full service record for him, which was um, a result from my point of view in terms of um, uh, research. And, you know, there's lots of elements we can see from his record, and I appreciate, again, that the information might be small, and the record is much bigger than what I'm obviously showing on the screen. But we get lots of that kind of um, important information. We know that he joined the Royal Engineers uh, at Aldershot on the 30th of March, 1878, that he was born in Pimlico in London, uh, that he stated at the time that his occupation was a painter, though he's also written Clark and that had been crossed out. Um, as well. And in the various other documents, we find that he was five foot nine, he had grey eyes, brown hair, you know, the usual kind of descriptive uh, features. And we also see that upon leaving the army, he had attained the rank of quartermaster, quartermaster sergeant instructor, and possessed service medals for uh, service in Egypt. Um, and also he'd served in Malta and Mauritius as well. And that we finally see that he was discharged at the age of 40 in 1899 and that's the proceedings of his discharge in the middle there and we can obviously then pick up you know and again i'm sure lots of you have done this kind of research if you're searching for individuals we can pick up his story in various other sets of records we can take the census um so the 1901 census for example just after his discharge uh he's living in, in tottenham in north london he's married um to, uh, his wife is minnie and they married in 1885 um he's he's in the 1901 census he's listing his occupation as clerk slash accountant and he's got three sons living at home uh, louis victor age 13 percy arthur james age nine who was born in mauritius whilst he was on service um and then frederick william age six and in uh, 1911 uh, louis senior is listed then as still as a clerk um, while his youngest son, Frederick, the last of the three brothers, is um, still living at home and listed as a clerk in the army. And, there, and this is where we can kind of pick up their stories from the First World War. So, um, again, handily, we obviously, I had lots of information all of a sudden from the census records of his children and what they, uh, what they were called um, as well. So, you know, I could then look up their foot, whether any of them served in the First World War. So obviously we knew that Louis Senior was employed by the War Office and then later the Royal Hospital Chelsea. But then we see that Louis Senior appears uh, to have followed the same path as his father. He was a sapper in the Royal Engineers and Percy was a private and was later then commissioned as a Lieutenant in the London Regiment. And by this time, Frederick, um, the third son had also been commissioned as a Lieutenant in the second battalion, Royal Fusiliers. Um, and again, he was actually awarded a military cross at Plug Street on the 4th, 5th September 1918. Um, so again, there were kind of that, the various kind of records and the kind of highlights, some of the gallantry uh, award um, records that, that we also hold at TNA. And then obviously I was also able to consult his battalion's war diary because I knew the specific battalion and regiment that he was in. Uh, and when he received the medal, I obviously consulted the war diary to find out what the kind of overall action was that he was participating in. And that kind of moves us on very quickly uh, here, and I hope I'm kind of not flying through too much, uh, to First World War records, and, and particularly First World War, the ranks um, to begin with. So um, most of these records, as again, I'm sure you know, um, are digitized, those that survived. Um, the set of records for the other ranks are known as the burnt um, documents, but they are name searchable and downloadable on Ancestry or Find My Past. Uh, and like I say, it's around about a third of these records survived. The rest were destroyed in bombing during the Second World War. 
And this is a, a, just a brief example of uh, one, which again, I'm sure you're very familiar with these records if, if you've done any um, First World research, First World War research yourself. This is uh, for uh, Reginald Battersby, who was uh, believed to be the youngest known commissioned officer uh, during the First World War. He was commissioned at the age of 15, uh, served in the East Lancashire Regiment. Uh, and this, but this is actually um, his initial enlistment, enlistment was as a private, in fact. Um, uh, he served on the first day of the Somme, um, and, and again, we have various um, information about his, his service, and we also have his uh, officer's record as well, which I'll talk about in a minute. We also have other ranks pension records in WO364, which again, like the previous series, are name searchable and downloadable, those that survive as well and quite often they'll include the attestation papers, the statements of services, the, the usual things that you would hope to find um, in a uh, an, in another rank um, service record. And again this is a, just to kind of illustrate that point we have the attestation form on the left but then we have a medical report here which talks about uh, gunshot wounds and the left arm um, and then kind of quite detailed information about this this particular individual who is in Belfast actually um who you know has very had limited mobility and insufficient blood supply and stuff like that to to his arm so there's some really detailed information that you can get in some of these records again it can be hit and miss as to whether the individual that you're looking for that it contain whether it contains the information you know that kind of detail uh, if you like um but you know it is there and it can be found uh, if if you're fortunate enough that the person you're looking for uh, has has that kind of information, and then for officer service records, so these aren't available online, um, unfortunately. But as you might imagine, are very common requests. They are, um, I believe, our most requested record series are our first world war officer service records of, of all of our collections. Um, you know, again, they offer often referred to pensions and estates and and kind of um, those kind of things, and they do vary massively in size. And I'll show an illustration of that. And again, I'm sure for those of you who have um, used these records, which the, most of them are in WO339, but you can also find them in a few other series as well. Um, for those of you who have used these, you you will be aware that uh, they do vary massively in size. And again, we have a specific guide on officers. And this, yeah, this, like I say, an example, the, the one standing up at the back is the example of one individual. It's two whole volumes of, of correspondence, whereas the one lying down is a different person and it maybe contains five, six, seven pages, that, and that's all. So it does massively vary depending on the individual, depending particularly on the correspondence generated between the officer and or the officers next of kin and the war office, normally to do with pensions, I must say. Um, but, but you can get lots of other information in there. If an officer had been killed, you get lots, sometimes get information about dependents and what, what was kind of going on in that in the 1920s and 30s with their dependents as well. So um, it does it does vary and the size massively varies as well. Uh, and just uh, here's another example, this is Wilfred Owens, um, the poet Wilfred Owens, um, officer service records so we, on the left hand side, his uh, territorial commission, his temporary commission, I should say. Um, and then on the right hand side, some remarks from the proceedings of a medical board that was convened uh, when he was uh, away from the front. So, um, again, a high profile example, I suppose, in, in this case. Um, but but an interesting one nonetheless, I, I hope um, you agree. And then just kind of relating more generally to um, First World War Service, and again, I hope I'm not, I'm not preaching too much to the converted here, but in terms of your, your own knowledge of these records, which I'm so sure much of the audience already has a vast knowledge of these kind of records, but I didn't want to skip over them, um, are the medal index cards, and these relate to both uh, officers and other ranks and, and are downloadable uh, from the National Archives website or they are also available on Ancestry as well um, and they're searchable by name, regimental number and, and corps uh, as well as rank. Um, they're not obviously as detailed as a service record but they can provide the addition, some additional information if, if the service record hasn't survived and some 
it, I think on the whole, the most important important piece of information that a medal index card can contain is a battalion number for an individual. If that isn't known, um, and, and if a service record doesn't survive, it's very difficult to establish that. The medal index cards will often include that information. And what that, of course, means is that you can search the battalion war diary, um, and it kind of unlocks that um, as an option for you. And I'll talk about war diaries in a bit more detail in a moment, but it does kind of open that, that open up that option um, to you. And the war diary isn't necessarily going to include the details of an individual, but but of course you can get a sense and a flavor of what someone was doing um, during their war service. And, and as I say, the medal index card can, can help you establish that information uh, as well. And here we go, we have a unit war diary. So uh, these again are uh, on the whole, most of the, certainly those relating to the Western Front are in the W95 series and those relating to the Western Front have been digitized. Um, as I say, you know, for those, if there is anyone here who's not seen or used a war diary, they can be a great way of finding out what a unit was doing at any given time uh, during the war. Doesn't always contain details about information, uh, about individuals, sorry, but you can find, uh, it can contain information not found uh, in other records. And, and again, sometimes you have to be lucky. It's more likely that it will include details of an individual if they're an officer. But sometimes you can get lucky and, and will include other ranks as well. And I'll, I'll briefly talk about an example of that in a moment. And I, these are just a few examples. You know, the war diary, again, for those of you who haven't seen a war diary, you have the kind of the day to day goings on, um, the, the diary itself, if you like. But quite often, diaries include other bits of information. Here we have a, a summary of service. This is in this case, Gold Coast Regiment. Um, we also have a nominal role of individuals um, here on, in this case, which quite often you find um, more generally as well. We have things like training insights, which um, are fascinating. Um, so, you know, we've got lots of different kind of uh, information about bayonet training in this particular um, example. Uh, we've got things about army life and conditions as well. This is from the 24th Field Ambulance in July 1915. Um, various information uh, here, and then I always I always enjoy this sketch of Messine Ridge in May 1915, um, which has lots of different um, kind of landmarks. If you like, it's got the trench lines in there as well, and of course you could do a kind of cross reference with um, some of the trench maps um, that we hold at the National Archives as well, uh, aerial photographs, etc. Um, with this kind of thing, but I always enjoy this sketch um, found, found in one of the diaries here too, uh, in the appendix. And so like I say, you know, ultimately, uh, it's not just about the diary, you can find lots of other things uh, as well. So I just wanted to briefly talk about an, an individual, and this is someone actually, for those of you who um, read Stand 2, the WFA magazine, um, I wrote an article about this individual uh, in Stand two, two, two years or so ago, I think it was now. Um, uh, Edward Paget, who was um, a, a private, um, and basically it was a, you know, as as I'm sure might be the case for for some of you, uh, and in someone I knew, uh, he was a relation of theirs. The family knew some something about his first world war service. They didn't quite know what he did. Um, they thought he was conscripted after 1916. They thought that uh, perhaps he was a prisoner of war, but they weren't sure. Um, and obviously, you know, the records, thankfully, were able to confirm some of that when, when I did some of the research with them. So, again, a stroke of fortune meant that his attestation form uh, exists. Uh, it wasn't destroyed. So that automatically helps us a lot, uh, as I've kind of said, because it provides us with lots of different information about him. So we can see that he was a he was employed as a barber, for example. He was living in Leeds uh, in a number of addresses. He had no previous mili military experience. And most importantly, as I say, the family had assumed that he'd been conscripted, but he actually attested voluntarily in December 1915. So not long before conscription, but um, uh, he did attest before. And he was mobilized 
um, and posted to his regiment, the 15th, 17th West Yorkshire Regiment, uh, on the 8th of April, 1916. Uh, eventually making his way to the Western Front in early 1918, uh, just in time for the German Spring Offensives. So, and it's kind of at this point that the kind of limits of his service record um, are clear to see uh, on the 27th of March, and you might see it somewhere listed on in that middle page he's listed as being uh, as posted as posted missing and then late in december 1918 he's listed as prisoner of war so obviously what i the next stage what i did was i ordered up the war diary for the 15th 17th west yorkshire regiment for the period january 1918 onwards and and again it was then possible to ascertain the circumstances around paget's capture but looking through the diary from early 1918, it also provided other details about what the regiment was doing, um, but also some interesting snippets about military life. And this is, again, where I got lucky, really, in the war diary. So the battalion um, had taken part in what was the 93rd Infantry Brigade inter-platoon in, inter competition, I should say, in January 1918. And this competition was held between 500 other infantry platoons and was won by number four platoon of A Company of the battalion and as it so happens private Paget was a member of that platoon um and and i know that because a nominal role was given in the diary um for the winning company and, and Paget is listed there uh, specifically he was part of number three section of the platoon and the role also shows that it contained a victoria uh, a cross winner uh, in that a private wb butler uh, as far as i'm aware not a relation uh, of mine but the, uh, just thinking about this kind of circumstances around his capture, um, you know, we've got lots of bits about other sports competitions and exercises, but also then on the 22nd of March, the battalion moved to the Bullocor sector uh, with a strength of 21 officers and 625 other ranks. Um, and, you know, essentially what happened is that the battalion was completely overrun. The wounded were, were left um, and he, along with 500 other ranks were reported on the 30th of March as being uh, missing. But then his service record also includes other dis uh, information. So we have a history sheet of British soldiers interned in Switzerland, which is the right hand side here, um, states his date of arrival in the country, um, and then sort of various other bits of information about his injuries uh, as well. And then if we look at the, the fairly newly digitized First World War pension records, we also see Paget's award of a pension through, through Ancestry um, here, and we can see various details about his pension. He was um, assessed and, and eligible for a 40% uh, disablement pension um, and gratuity uh, because of in injuries resulting from a gunshot wound in his right leg. Um, so again, lots of kind of very detailed and interesting information. And on the right hand side, it's, that's a page from uh, the war diary for the 30th of March there um, as well. So, you know, really from starting from a very small story, I was delighted to be able to kind of pick up that story in a bit more detail. And then just very quickly, uh, this is just a, a kind of a slightly different one for, for an officer. So J.B. Priestley. Um, I recorded a short film about Priestley's First World War service, which is very interesting in its own way. We have his officer service record, which includes his original attestation form. He enlisted as a private um, in September 1914, so very early on, obviously, in the war, uh, eventually gaining a commission. We've got various correspondence in his service record, um, and of his, the war diary talks about um within the war diary itself talks about Priestley being sent back behind the lines because he was suffering from shell shock and, and in his service record we have shell shock um, listed a number of times uh, in that case as well but that's just I'll kind of quickly pass over that one because I'm very conscious of time and I want to move on um very quickly um to the Royal Navy and then the Royal Air Force and like I say, I appreciate that I'm flying through a lot of this information um, this evening. I don't want to, um, you know, and, and, and I'm definitely not covering uh, everything. And, and really, when it came, certainly when it came to the kind of Royal Navy and the Air Force stuff, what I wanted to do 
we show you a few sets of the, the bigger kind of more important sets of records and then some of the more kind of interesting and intriguing ones, which I hope you agree at least anyway, that they're interesting and, and intriguing. So I just wanted to start by mentioning uh, in the Royal Naval context, ships, musters and pay books. And we, I'm going back kind of both prior to the First World War and, and during at this point. So, um, you know, prior to the First World War, ships, muster and pay books, they kind of range in date from the, actually the late 17th century um, up until 1884. And again, can be found in a, a variety of different um, record series, uh, Admiralty records in this case, obviously. Um, and again, you can find records, uh, you can search Discovery, by, Discovery, which is the National Archives catalogue by ship's name, but not an individual's name. So again, more often than not, uh, if you're searching for an individual, you, you really need to know at least the name of one of the ships that they served. Um, otherwise, it's very challenging. Uh, certainly for the earlier you go, it becomes much more challenging. Um, to, to find an individual without knowing the name of the ship, because that's how these ships, musters and pay books tend to be catalogued. And like I say, that can be the name of one of the ships that someone might have served on, and a rough or an approximate date is always useful. Um, and you might, you might find them in there, but it might take a bit of time uh, if you don't have an exact date and an exact ship. But really, that, they're kind of, that's a crucial bit of information, really. And this is an example of what, what the ship's muster um, looks like. And again, these ledgers, they're not dissimilar to some of the army ones that we looked at for, for the 18th and 19th century, um, containing various different bits of information um, and personal information about individuals. We also have something called continuous service engagement books uh, available in a couple of different um, record series. Um, we have two examples here on the slide, just to give you an idea of what they look like. They, these are, these records are digitized, so that's something and, and hopefully useful. A lot most of these records are um, for most of the period, so they tend to be name searchable uh, on the National Archives catalog as well. So that is another kind of handy uh, tick, and that and that's partly down a, a lot to the work of one of my colleagues, who's one of our naval specialists. He, he works. Um, uh, incredibly hard to do a lot of this kind of cataloging by name uh, to make them much more accessible to, to people. So um, this is just a couple of examples. Um, we also have um, officer records um, in ADM 196, and this is an individual, William Cadman. Again, this is downloadable, and again, it gives you an idea. So we've got all of the different ships that the person served on, the dates of service, and then any remarks um, as well. Um, and then here, it's not massively clear that the, the digitized copy isn't massively, hugely helpful, but this is um, King George, George VI um, service record, which we have in our collection um, as well, um, which I thought I'd throw in here um, for interest. But again, it, it contains obviously similar information that you might find in anyone's as officer record as well. Uh, and it's just a slightly closer look at various different uh, information about the different ships and its conduct and ability and that kind of kind of insight there and again so I'd like to say it's not the best copy here um, but it is again downloadable from um, our website so do do have a look at that as well we obviously are sort of away from then the personnel much like with the army and, and also the air force we have a number of uh, a large number of operational records um, relating to the Royal Navy's activities um you know, again I found in various record series ADM1 tends to be one of the main record series and really you know the the, the ultimate kind of tip if you like for all of the above is is it's it's worth always worth searching ship names operational names the names of battles or you know especially for the second world war convoy numbers that tends to be a really useful way if you know someone who served uh, on convoys and you know convoy numbers for the second world war um, you know, searching by those convoy numbers can also be particularly useful um, because we do have a large number of those records as well. Uh, these are station records for so the various stations across the world and tend to be kind of entry books or orders or memoranda, uh, depending on what it is that you're looking at and depending on the period as well. And then I, what I've done is kind of just sketched out a few as I say, hopefully interesting records. This is an extract from HMS Victory, the captain's log of HMS Victory specifically. 
um, and describes the, um, what does this one describe? Um, uh, 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 yeah, sort of various, various bits and pieces. Um, we've got a journal extract from um, James Cook, um, which is slightly his first voyage, in fact. Um, so we've got sort of various correspondence in relation to that, references above there as well. We've got things like uh, illustrations showing effects of scurvy, for example, uh, as well. Um, so you sometimes find things that you wouldn't necessarily expect. Um, I, I often think uh, with, within some of these records, this is Horatio Nelson's first, uh, left, his Lieutenant's passing certificate from 1777. So a bit before the period I said I was gonna be talking about, but I, I always think it's an interesting record um, that we have. So as I say, information um, relating uh, to that. This is the extract from the Medical Officer's Journal of um, HMS Theseus, which uh, essentially describes the injury sustained by Nelson, which led to the amputation of his right arm. Um, so we've got that kind of detail within there as well. And obviously this, this kind of thing, particularly in the Medical Officer's Journals, which is another set of records we hold uh, in this context, um, has, you know, will have this kind of detail uh, for uh, any number of individuals uh, that were being treated by um, the med medical officer on board. And then just a, a much more modern uh, version, uh, and this is primarily because I was doing stuff, uh, things relating to the 40th anniversary of Operation Corporate, um, British Army, the, Brit the British service um, during the Falklands War. Um, this is taken from a diary of 40 commando um, and a few images from, from that diary uh, as well. Right, and then, so just kind of in a, the penultimate section, I guess, in, in a lot of way. And again, I know I only covered the, the Navy for a couple of minutes there, I must admit. Um, the Fly, Royal Flying Corps and Royal Air Force. Um, again, you know, we might think of uh, how air forces were used because, you know, that can help us um, to search for these kind of records. So air forces obviously took part in all of Britain's major campaigns from 1914-ish onwards, including operations at sea. So you will find Air Force records within not just those specific, specifically uh, relating to the Air Force, but also in Admiralty records and also War Office records as well. Um, there's often a distinction between home and overseas Air Forces, uh, as well as expedi expeditionary Air Forces as well. So again, the way in which the records are catalogued and ordered um, you know, the way in which they're found in the castle can also be, can also vary um, and, you know, reflects the type of organisation um, that they were part of. But, you know, ultimately what we're kind of talking about in a very broad sense, uh, in terms of the records that the National Archives holds, for, if, if, you're, if you're not aware, are records of crashes and accidents. Um, narratives and reports of, of operations, uh, but also uh, of um, kind of aircraft development to an extent, uh, but also aircraft use uh, and kind of policies around that. We have then specific information about operations and sorties, so down to, to that kind of level, and, and they're mainly found in operations records books. We have then, especially for the Second World War, records relating to places and targets. So we have a, an awful lot of records about bombing raids, um, ultimately, and, and kind of bomber command records, if you like. Um, and then kind of separate from that operational side, there are obviously the personnel records as, as well. Uh, as I say, you know, most of the records you can find in the air series, but you can kind of broadly, uh, I suppose, split them up into three levels, uh, if you like. So a higher level, so air policy and strategy. Um, so that might be cabinet or the air council, chief of um, appeal general staff, chief of the air staff, etc. You have middle level, so commands, campaigns and operations in general, home and overseas commands, um, the registers files. So they're, they're still fairly high level. Um, you know, they're not going to include uh, individuals in the same way, but, but we'll give you an idea about policy um, and kind of the operational aspects um, of campaigns and, and operational learning. 
and then the lower level of that so that might be specific squadrons air crew events and places operation record books as i've said and then also service records uh, and as i say some will also be found in various series not just the air series uh, as well you know and just like with the army records and the navy records you know quite often with the earlier army records it's useful to know a regiment with the naval records it's useful to know a ship in this case there is some information that is also useful to have about um, individuals in particular if you're looking for an individual so that might be a number of uh, squadron for smaller operations that might be wings groups commands and headquarters for larger kind of stuff who you know what commands what wings or groups were involved in a particular campaign for example uh, obviously a date range is, is helpful also things like bases targets or locations especially if you're interested in a, and a very common inquiry actually that we get are you know in people looking for uh, information about uh, a specific raid on a city on a certain date or a town on a certain date again especially during the second world war and then things like the names of crew or commanders and names of operations and functions so not all of these are essential but you will need to know something ultimately uh, and particularly knowing squadron numbers and wing numbers is is especially useful uh, in this context now we think about the, you know the personnel record um oh sorry uh, the personnel records so we've got albert ball um we've got sorry i don't know why that's uh, happening there so we have albert ball's um service record as well um we have things like uh, an aer the aerial photographs of german trenches which i mentioned um, um earlier on uh, in the context of war diaries um we have things like a wing diary so this is uh, the encounter with um Richthofen's flying circus during the um, first world war so you'll see that uh, it is a war diary in the same uh, format as as the uh, the army war diaries um but they give give you that kind of insight uh, as from april 1917 specifically and then we have kind of operational resources um as well more generally um so you know this is a plan of attack a german attack on crete and um, this is uh, 616 Squadron from, which is essentially Douglas Bader's last sortie. So there's lots of information about his uh, last sortie uh, in this operations record book uh, in particular, um, which um, again give you a bit of kind of insight talking about Bader becoming a, a prisoner of war um, in, in this context. Uh, we also then have the, the operation record book uh, for the mission which attempted to fly in. Bader a um, prosthetic limb into his, into the prisoner of war camp that he was being held. So we have the operation record book for that um, during during the Second World War as well. And then, so that, that's kind of, like I say, a, a very quick uh, run through some of the, um, the RAF records. And again, the really useful thing with a lot of the RAF records large number of the personnel records up until um, certainly the late 1920s into the 1930s are available to download a lot of most of those service records are searchable by name um, and can be downloaded from the national archives website um, and then the operation records books a lot of those in fact we have those um, books all the way through the, the latter half of the 20th century as well and a large number including for the second world war are also available uh, can be downloaded there are gaps in some of those record books um, there are also gaps in some of the combat reports that we have for individuals both during the first and the second world war but again they tend to be name searchable and are also downloadable um, from our website so a lot of those kind of at the, the lower level if you think of those three tiers in the RAF context those lower level records have been digitized um, as well which again is incredibly useful from you know certainly has been especially useful uh, in the last two and a half years uh, when access to the archive hasn't been quite as readily um, available so just before i finish to hopefully not everyone's relief but probably some people's relief before i finish um i just wanted to kind of talk a little bit about post first world war records 
Um, and I've touched upon some of those, uh, particularly in the context of the RAF there at the end, but I, I wanted to sort of briefly think about some of the main sets of records that the National Archives holds um, that are post First World War. And then I very, very briefly wanted to just mention the service record transfer from the Ministry of Defence. As I say, it, it's kind of as a, it, it's not quite preempting any questions that people might have. Um, but it's often a question I'm asked is relating to Second World War service records and their availability and how you access them and when are they coming to the National Archives. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment uh, in a little bit of detail. So for the post-First post, post -first World War period, and, and this is really especially for the Second World War, those of you who, who are interested and want to search um, for Second World War records, um, Again, as I've already mentioned, operations records books are um, a key um, element for the RAF. There's also ship's logs for the, for the Navy. And then war diaries also exist, I'm sure um, you're aware. So in the Army's context for war diaries, these ones aren't digitized, unfortunately. Um, and again, that's a question we're of, often asked, why don't we digitize the Second World War diaries? And it's because they are about 10 times as many as for the First World War diaries. They're enormous. There are so many, so many more war diaries for the Second World War. So it, it's, just, it's not practical actually to, to um, digitize those. So they are only available uh, really on site or you can request copies to be made for, for a fee, but, but uh, generally speaking, they're available um, on site. And, and again, they provide that same kind of information as you might expect um, as the, those for the First World War. We also hold a, a large number of prisoner of war records, um, less so for the First World War. Um, and I, I didn't really touch upon that for the First World War. We only really have samples of, of records for the First World War. But for the Second World War, the records are much more complete. They include camp inspections uh, by the Red Cross, all of the reports relating to those. And, and a really exciting project that is still ongoing um, is our, the recataloguing of WA416, which are um, prisoner of war index cards. Lots of those have photographs of individuals, individuals included on them, um, which, uh, as I say, it's an ongoing project. It's nearly there, um, but they are kind of a three, a three, a yeah, a uh, five. Sorry, not a three, uh, a five size cards uh, with lots of kind of personal information. As I say, a lot of the cards have photographs as well, and they're an incredibly interesting um, element to our prisoner of war records as well. As I mentioned earlier, we have courts martial records, uh, gallantry medal records. So if you want uh, information relating to uh, the kind of general service stuff for the Second World War, that they're still held by the Ministry of Defense. We obviously have, there's also army lists available. And again, some of those are available through the National Library of Scotland um, for the Second World War period as well. There are the British Army casualty lists, which on the whole, those indexes are digitized, I think from memory. And then we also have uh, SOE service records, individual records of service as well, um, which tend to be um, uh, incredibly interesting. And I just wanted to, to illustrate someone here that I've been searching. This is not quite a, um, a, a scoop, um, but this is an individual I've been researching for um, a, a forthcoming exhibition. He, he was um, a German Jewish refugee actually in the 1930s who was then interned in 1940 um, as part of the internment policy of um, German and particularly German and Italian nationals. Uh, he was later in the war um, permitted to join a pioneer corps and he was then recruited by SOE. Um, and this is from uh, some of these elements, some of these records are from his service record, including a photograph um, of, of the individual here. We also have, so on the top left, there is his report of internment. On the bottom left, on the bottom left is then his naturalization certificate from the mid 1950s. He was a naturalized um, citizen um, at the end of the war. But again, it just kind of illustrates, I think, and, uh, some of those um, records that you can get hold of um, and the insights that they can they can provide. So just to go back to this very quickly. Um, and I promise you, as I say, I know it's eight o'clock already, I will finish up. This is the last thing I'm gonna say is to do with the, the service record transfer. So some of you might be aware of this transfer. Um, there's There are various news stories on the National Archives website 
um, relating to this. So this is a project transferring around about nine and a half million service records from the Ministry of Defence to the National Archives. As it turns out, it's probably more like 12 million um, records um, and it's the biggest transfer of or biggest single transfer of records to the National Archives um, ever so it equates to around about 33 kilometers worth of shelving space um, and normally the National Archives uh, brings in from all government departments about 1.5 kilometers um, so it's about 27 years worth of um, uh, accessions that we're planning to bring in in the next uh well it's been going on for two years now um for the next four years so it's a six year, six year project so it's, it's enormous it's incredibly um time consuming it involves an awful lot of us as you might expect as head of military records i'm very closely involved in that process but it means that we have started to open up some of those service records um, in particular, the first set of records we released were for individuals who served in the Royal Electrical and Mechanical Engineers. Um, so they're available to search by name on the catalogue um, already. Um, but we are also, we're, we're kind of incrementally uh, opening other records. So there's another 100,000 or so service records um, available and, and searchable by name that have recently gone on the catalogue. Um, and this will increasingly uh, be the case and again particularly in the first world war context one of the sets of records that that is being transferred is the the kind of half a million or so service records for those individuals who went on to serve beyond 1920 so um, some of you might have experienced this in your research uh, looking for someone trying to find a service record for an individual uh, who served in the first world or you can't find it and it, it, it it's the case essentially that it's because they carried on their service post-war and it meant that their service record was not part of um, the original records transferred to the National Archives so um, they are part of this transfer um, as well and um, there again there are various ways of accept accessing um, these uh, records as you kind of go forward um, and all of that information again is a, is available in a, one of the um, research guides that we have. And I will just finish there with this really dull looking uh, research guide, a link to the research guide. Um, because like I say, I, I do, I will stress to people, please do, um, if you're interested in knowing a bit more, finding out a little bit more, um, do have a look at the research guides. There are around about 350 research guides for all of the different collections that we hold in the National Archives. But I, I think at least 100 of them relate to military records. Um, so do have a look at them if you're interested in a particular service, a particular period of time, do, do have a look. And if you have any other questions, um, having looked at those guides at, at a later date, we also obviously have an inquiry service and do, do get in touch and we're always willing to help. And with that, I will stop and I'll stop sharing my screen so that I can see some of you a bit better. But thank you very much.